as I just said, it was a very dramatic week in Geneva last week. Now we're in Amsterdam, and this is an opportunity, of course, to update people here on the developments last week. So perhaps you'd like to explain to us um, the agreement that was achieved finally last week. What, what does it actually mean for the world's postal system and the world's postal operators? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Morita. Distinguished uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I say assalamu alaikum. A very warm welcome and uh, good morning to you. Well, uh, I must say, we are becoming too familiar with each other now. We see each other quite often and uh, this is something which is very positive. You are the captains of the industry, you are the drivers of the postal world, you are the decision makers. And uh, it's very interesting that uh, for a very long time we've never had this kind of forum where we get together first of all even to discuss our own issues. So seeing you today is uh, really a pleasure for me. Uh, a couple of years back, myself and Deputy Director General realized the absence of these men and women, the CEOs, from the postal UP headquarters. The reason for that is historical, but again, it was practical. We had very long, long, long sessions, three weeks, four weeks, and our CEOs could not come for that long to the EPU. I'm giving the context to you. Know? So, we created what we call a CEOs forum. We realized that we needed it. And probably this is the fourth edition we have done. We have done it in Istanbul uh, last time. We have done it uh, in Paris. We have done it in Russia. And uh, this is the fourth one. So again, I want to welcome all the CEOs who are here present today who found the time, really, for making this happen. Very dramatic week last week, I must say. And uh, I, I don't know how to tell this story, but. Uh, the same men and women who helped deliver that are the ones who are sitting in front of me here. So I'm telling the story to the people who really uh, participated in the whole entire exercise in front of me. So, but as a matter of a good feeling, I must say that it was a dramatic week. Um, you know very well that the history of uh, terminal reduced system, which was really the genesis, the, 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 the crux of the things that brought together in, uh, in Geneva last week, it's something that's not new. It started nearly 50 years ago in 1969 in Tokyo. So every year on a year on a year we've been doing, every Congress cycle rather, mm -hmm. we've been doing incremental changes to the thing, but we've never had such a drastic reform. And for the last probably 10 years or, or so, it has been a serious concern for many countries. So in the last cycle and cycle before that, I know that uh, this topic was really very on top of everybody's mind. But the real push for this solution to this problem came when uh, the United States of America sent us a very strong warning last year to tell us that they are going to quit the Union if the problem is not solved. That was the impetus. Mm -hmm. So from October last year, uh, my team, together with all the members here, really took the message very loud and clear. And uh, for once, I think there was a lot of effort done by the countries. But uh, the problem itself was so complex. It involves money, it involves a lot of uh, interests, and therefore member countries had very many views on these things, different views, really irreconcilable, some of them. So there was option A, and there's option B, and there's B minus, and there's C plus, and C minus, and C this. And so we were all over the place. We had no solution to this problem. Of course, the International Bureau Secretary's role here was to play a neutral role, and help member countries really with information and uh, encourage them to be able to come to the compromise. So what happened here is that, um, but we left really the main decision then. After 10 months of grueling, uh, real consultations and discussions and meetings and everything, then an extraordinary Congress was called to deal with the matter. By the time we were all coming to this Congress, no one knew we were nowhere near compromise. So that's when um, I, and my team really decided that now we need to take uh, uh, the matter, we get involved ourselves now directly and come with an option that was going to form a compromise basis for, for the countries. I called for a team of countries, that four countries to come here, work out. I knew A was not going to fly because it was too extreme and I knew B was not going to fly, they were to another extreme. So the solution and the convergence was around C. 
but C had many variants and 12 different amendments to it. So this is what we did on a, on a Sunday and Monday in a hotel called Warwick. We burnt midnight oil, but uh, countries had already taken hardline positions. Some of them were so upbeat and they knew they had the numbers, so therefore it was a, a, a number game and they didn't want to compromise. And I was very, very disappointed to see really that uh, when we come to a, the, a matter of this nature and we are almost coming to the edge, some countries take hardly position. So we then came in. I always say this, International Bureau Secretariat is made of professional, highly intelligent, well-experienced uh, individuals. We may be neutral, but it doesn't mean that we don't have an opinion. Mm -hmm. So we said we'll step in and we drafted what is called a compromise position, we call it a V option. We didn't want to call it a D, because D will signify a disaster. <laughs> so we said we had A, B, and C, but we didn't want to call it a D. So we said let's come with a victory, victory for all. And that victory, really, at the end of the day, after long negotiations, a lot of discussions, consultations, midnight, uh, different parties, we played uh, diplomacy at the highest level. I have never seen anything like that. Yeah. And we were able, finally, to close with a victory which really, in, in any sense, was bits and pieces from A, B, C, C minus, and all this together. We have to put it into a blender and turn it and come up with a victory. And I think uh, the member countries uh, really uh, finally agreed on that, and I was very relieved that we came to that level. Yeah, certainly, uh, from having taken part as well as a, as a journalist watching, watching and uh, reporting on the events last week, it was certainly a dramatic week. and. Uh, I can also confirm to the audience that a lot of people were up very late uh, on, I think it was the Tuesday night going into the Wednesday, ready to, to find a deal. Um, let's look forward now a little bit. So I, I think everybody is now fairly aware of uh, what happened in Geneva last week. But for the postal operators here in the room, what do they have to do next? What happens next? Do people suddenly have to go back now from Amsterdam and panic and start doing lots of things? What's the process? Perhaps you could explain to Well, um, I'm talking to the, uh, the converter. They know what to do. Uh, what happens here is, this is the rates. This is a commercial rates between the countries. How do we compensate each other when we send uh, parcels and packets to, to one another? The fundamental thing which here I think we're trying to protect as we craft this thing is to maintain, first of all, certain principles. The principle is that UPU is, uh, sorry, UPU is uh, certainly a, a multilateral organization. It is not, it's a treaty organization. And therefore you have to get the consensus of 192 countries to be able to come to a, agree on certain things. So what is important for me is, uh, is that uh, going forward, the rates we have come up with uh, must now be uh, adopted. Before I was interrupted by this phone, sorry, my apologies again, I was coming to the point that we need to ensure that this is a treaty and we must respect it. And that uh, the principle for me is that, uh, number one, it's an intergovernmental organization, number two, it is a, a multilateral system, and number three, it must not forget the founding principles and objectives for which this organization was established. That is universal service. We must be able to address the needs of every citizen on this planet. The reasons why we, we, our tariffs were so low to begin with was to ensure universality, to ensure access to every citizen. The prices were kept low, up to two kilograms. So that in the olden days it was communication, basically, a communication organization. So that the citizens of this world can be able to have access. Now, that changed over time. When the e-commerce came in and the uh, the category of mail uh, of two kilograms now carried, started carrying commercial goods. That's when the dynamics changed. So now, with this new principle, we still want to maintain the universality and keep the prices of universal service products uh, to be accessible to citizens. That's the first one. Number two, the commercial goods, this is where the countries have now come to, we have to fundamentally a shift from the traditional way we used to settle our, our time reduce. We are now moving to a new area where it's going to be self-declared rates. Yes. What this means is that from beginning 2021, going forward, we would not want to do. We didn't want to do it overnight. We wanted to do it in a structured manner so that we can be able not to create shocks in the market or to the customers. 
So it was incremental, 21, 22, 23, 24, up to 25. Mm -hmm. We are going to have incremental increases. To be able to meet that 70% of the domestic tariffs of this country. What this means for our colleagues here is that you need to know, first of all, your domestic tariffs. Some of our tariffs were not designed really for commercial purposes, so you have to rethink that when you go back home. They are meant for social services. I know South Africa and many other countries raise this matter very seriously, that developing countries' tariffs are not designed for commercial purposes. So now they have to look at that critically and make sure that, you know, they set the right tariffs. So, first of all, we were trying to protect the citizens and the customers and the clients by not creating a one shock thing. I think it's only the United States of America who requested for what is called a dual system, a fast track. They have other political agendas for this reason or commercial reasons for that matter, but they took a strategic decision they wanted in July next year. I think probably, but this is not, we are open that close, not only for US, but literally any country that can be able to use it by then. So therefore, the, the post in this room and more generally the world's postal operators certainly need to do a lot over the coming months. They need, as you just said, they need to look at their domestic tariffs. They need to think about how they can adapt the international. They have to adapt, they have rates. to adjust, they have to uh, uh, really uh, prepare themselves for the new rates. This is what, basically yeah. what they have to do. Yeah. So more, more generally, what you just said, of course, is that the world is changing. Uh, e-commerce is nothing new. Um, everybody here in the room experiences e-commerce, the, the massive growth of parcels every day. So um, taking perhaps a longer term f uh, view to the future, what do you see as the main, let's say, the opportunities, but also the challenges for the uh, world's postal operators uh, to adapt to this dramatically and rapidly changing uh, world of, of, let's say, e-commerce, where mail, of course, is becoming less and less important in many countries? Well, I think, colleagues, um, um, we all understand this industry very well. Um, uh, it's an old institution with all rules and regulations, and uh, is uh, we require every f to make f every four years to make changes. This is the problem we are facing: is that the, the pace of change in the industry and the dynamics in society is such that uh, a four-year cycle, first of all, is not uh, desirable. That's why we came up with what's called uh, every midterm congress every two years. That was a proposal which we got to Istanbul to see that our decision cycle first of all can be shortened. That's one thing I was going to recommend. The second thing is that. Uh, we need a wider reform of the union. Mm -hmm. We have been, up to now, UPU was a UN organization dealing specifically only with designated operators. <coughs> that has been for the century, and that's up to now. But let's be frank to one another here. We have just found from statistics and data in UPU that all the UPU member countries, GEOs put together, hold less than 30% of the global market. Where is the rest? The rest is with the private sector. Now we want to ask ourselves, does it make any more sense to continue making UPU only specifically for these nature operators or the whole entire postal industry? I have one challenge with that. I don't want to throw these men and women from the postal sector who have worked 145 years to develop the system under the bus. This is their union. They are the standards and systems and procedures and investment they have made over the years. But the, the private sector came 20, 30 years ago and now have a 70% of the traffic. But we have to face that reality and ask ourselves, can we sustain UPU as only business operators business? The answer is no. Now the question is, the same very countries here are dealing with those private sectors at their national levels. The governments have opened up the market for them. They are working with them. The DHLs are working with us. Now the question is, do you think it's time we ask these guys to come through the front door come to the UPU, just like ITU, mm -hmm. and then they pay for the services, not to come and negotiate individually with you, but come, and then you people now set the tariffs and the terms and conditions under which they're going to come yourselves. And then the UPU now represents the global postal industry. That is the proposal which is in our strategic plan, and which was adopted by the ministers in Addis Ababa last year. Mm -hmm. We have run seven regional round tables, and we are coming with the crafting up of the next vision of 2030 for the Union. That is the document which is going to come to the next Congress. And if that passes, then it will mean then opening the UPU to the wider sector. I want to hear the views of these members a little later on that. The other thing which I find very interesting is the other reform which I want to, I will, I will leave the stage very soon, but the other reform which I find critical, which all of you are familiar with, is the contribution model system of this Union. We have done with the reform on the, on the structural reforms. 
We have done the reforms on the on the representation of the POC council. I remember last time. We have done the one on time reduced now. The next thing is the contribution model, which has always been also been avoided and uh, delayed. This we are going to bring it to the table this October and February, and then of course to the Congress in Abidjan. And I want a solution to that problem before I leave the stage. And the last and but not least one is, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, the other things that I, I would really want to deal with, the 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 quorum issue. Our quorum system is is really outdated, and it has, it gives us a lot of problem all the time. The question of asking some of our rules requiring a physical, even sending your documents by physically alone, that that itself we're electronic age three. So there are things that need to change. And finally, I want to say that e-commerce, financial service, and digital space is where we need to compete if we are going to survive in the future. Any post office which is analog or which is going to deal with the, the traditional system, if you think you're going to survive, forget it. You're not in that area because the, the countries, the society, the citizens of this planet are not there anymore. So modernize the post office. I have been to uh, Kazakhstan recently, I must say, if they're here. I've seen a, a 21st century post office now going to robotics and what is called uh, drone systems. That is where we need to be. Right. So, so you, you have quite an agenda for reform, for, train, for changes, in fact, a transformation of the entire postal system, opening up the UPU to private uh, carriers perhaps in the future if, if the vote is accepted. Um, you just mentioned the planet. Now, of course, talking about the planet, there's one big issue out there which is, in a sense, much bigger than all of us, and that is the planet. Um, I'm talking, of course, about sustainability, I'm talking about climate change, I'm thinking of the uh, worldwide protests that took, uh, took place not only last week, but over the last year or so. Now, from the perspective of the postal, postal sector and the postal operators, what can the posts do to address these challenges? Are the posts doing enough? Have they done enough so far? What more, what more can be done? Right, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think, colleagues, uh, the planet Earth is the only place we live in and uh, it is the responsibility of every citizen on this planet to be able to protect it. We've gone way, way, way beyond this capacity of this planet to sustain itself if the present day uh, business as usual type of things continue. So UPU is very, very much aware of the challenges and we have been, for the last couple of years, been working on programs and activities uh, to reduce our carbon footprint on us. We were trying to get away from the diesel vehicle driven vehicles. We are going to electronic and cleaner energy systems. We, are, we have gone paperless. We don't cut trees anymore. We, we, are, we have, uh, of course, we have a, lot, a big voice. We have produced stamps and uh, create awareness in societies all over the globe to be able to be actually the advocates and the ambassadors for the planet uh, Earth. So I think we will continue to reinforce those. And of course, uh, as you're aware, some countries have put money on the table, like Japan and others for the disaster risk management programs, which I want to thank them for. So if we can be able to get ourselves, really uh, that consciousness is very important that all of us take responsibility for what we do. It is increment, everyone, if we contribute to, to sustaining a clean energy, clean uh, way of doing things, uh, planting trees, uh, uh, I think that is, is a responsibility for us. And the UPU is doing a great job on that already, but I want to encourage my colleagues to continue with that. Okay, thank you. Um, Derek, do we have time for questions from the floor at all? I, I would like to open, therefore open it up to questions from the floor to Mr. Hussein. Do we have any questions from anybody of a general nature for the UPU for Mr. Hussein? I think we have a few minutes here. Yes. Well, thank you. thank you. Yes, we do have one. Let's make one. I think the, the gentleman in the second row on the left here, the microphone is just coming to you. If you'd like to tell us your name and your organization, please. Good morning. Hello, Fiber from Peru, from Postal Services from Peru. What are the next steps? We are just beginning to model a new, a new business. There are a lot of excesses. Being on time has driven postal services and e-commerce to be abusive with the environment. So you get a lot of boxes, a lot of transit in order to get on time, and the tendencies are to be more responsible with the plan. So what are the next steps? Because we are maybe a couple of steps behind the, 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 uh, the commercial uh, postal services. 
but we have the opportunity to see what they are doing wrong and what to do better than them in order to be ahead of them. So, what are the next steps? Well, uh, can I answer this question, please? I'll answer as you ask questions. Um, first of all, I, I want to respectfully uh, uh, have a different opinion on the private sector doing better than us. The private sectors are using airlines to carry the mail, and we're using airlines. And the airlines create a lot of uh, what you call uh, gas. So they have no advantage over you that. There's nothing they do different than what we do in terms of the supply chain. What I, what I want to say is this. What more can we do? First of all, is just to be aware of the, the staff in your organization should be, be climate conscious. This is, this is the point. If we're addressing this particular issue, switch off the electricity when you don't need them, clean up your organizations, plant trees, and make sure that you know you don't, I mean, make, go digital to avoid uh, plant this. There are many small things we can do. So, that, to me, that is where I think we need to, to, to put a little more emphasis. Of course, globally, uh, we, can, we can work on, on strategic global issues on how to address this. UPU is already doing that during those programs and activities, and then we can be able to uh, contribute. We are not the only ones. The, the supply chain, we are not the only ones dealing with it. There are other, other sectors, industries who are involved in this matter, which, uh, which also have to play their role so that we, uh, we, we, we can all address this, this thing together. Okay. Do we have any more questions from the floor for Mr. Hussein at the moment? Okay. Please keep it fairly short. Thomas Rogan. Hello, Thomas Rogan of Curaçao. Um, I was in the Geneva Convention, and to be honest, on Monday and Tuesday it looked really, really bad. And then uh, we saw the emails coming in, uh, it's going to get better and better, and uh, like 3 o'clock we, we, we saw it going the right way. So I would like the UPU and our SG make a big compliment of a diplomatic uh, effort they did, and I want to congratulate you on that. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I received a lot of accolades, and Tanshu Bureau got a lot of praise for this, but we are very humble about this. We are your humble servants, and I, we don't want to take any credit for what happened in Geneva. I say it was a victory for member countries. Without your agreement, our ideas will not have been fruitful. I think there was goodwill at the end towards everyone played their role. Of course, it is our job as a director general. I do not want this union to collapse on my hands after 145 years. And what we did on Geneva last week, really, we gave UPU a new lease of life. We were at the brink of falling apart. It will have been a disruption of, of a global proportion in our supply chain management and the citizens of this world I mean, would have had a different, uh, completely UPU may have been a different thing altogether. But the, 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 the decisions we took in Geneva, I would say, were, were really, uh, is unprecedented. And I think we saved the union last week, and we have a stronger union going forward. This is my message to all of anyone who asks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you.